This is Boss Hog Radio, home of Born to Ride Radio. Born to Ride is sponsored in part by Rubenstein Law, 1-800-FL-LEGAL, representing riders since 1988. Offices throughout Florida, 1-800-FL-LEGAL. Born to Ride is a multimedia marketing and promotional machine with TV, magazines, streaming radio, and internet advertising opportunities. There are tens of thousands of motorcycles. We reach the people who ride them. Born to Ride. Find out more at borntoride.com. You can join the Motorcycle Enthusiast Conversation at 863-225-2000. Now, here's more of your hosts, Fester Jenkins and Mama Dukes on Born to Ride Radio. Welcome back to a Thursday edition of Born to Ride Radio on the Boss Hog Radio Network. I'm Fester Jenkins and... Hi everybody, I'm Mama Dukes. We've got Ron and Debbie Galetti back interesting show tonight yeah more good stuff coming up guys yeah it's gonna be fun good to see you guys again another fast week just flew by oh absolutely man you know we got to thank rubenstein law it's your florida law firm 1-800-FL-LEGAL you know they've been representing riders since 1988 and they have over 300 employees and they have what 12 offices across the state of florida then mm-hmm, 13 well, believe, yeah. <laughs> it's funny you bring that up because earlier on uh, one of my Facebook posts on the, the Bike Riders magazine, there was a guy that had p- made a post just today. He says, you know, I'm trying to get my neck surgery done. <clears throat> my lawyer that I hired has settled with the insurance company and ran off with my money, <gasps> and I can't oh get my, my money for the surgery for the bike accident there. You know, wow. I mean, you know so you got to be careful what yes. law firm you j- decide to use. When you're trying to recover uh, money for uh, damages to you there. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah, and they, they, they're they um, for real taking care of business. They fight for you. They go to court, and, you know, they win as much as they can. So, you know, when you have 12 different offices across the state and over 300 employees, you have a lot of specialists in different areas and they, they like to get out and support the community as well, right, Deb? Oh, yeah, they're real good at that. They, um, I found it very interesting, the technology that they use to illustrate cases with accidents and how it saves time in the court. It gives um, the jury visuals rather than just listening to people testify about, you know, what took place. So, it, they, you know, they're high tech, they're bilingual, they're across the state of Florida. So a great group of folks. Glad to be working with them. Have we uh, have we had any updates from Freedom Power Sports? Uh, DJ and Cody, did they anybody heard how their turnout turned out? Yeah, actually, they said it was a blast, and awesome. uh, we had our uh, a videographer Rex there that lives in Georgia, and he said he had a great time. He got drone footage. Awesome. So we'll be putting that together soon, and but they're still getting. I asked him for a follow up report. And uh, DJ said they're still putting it together, so maybe we can get them to follow up in a next week or something hmm, in a week good. or so mm-hmm. <clears throat> but guess what's coming up this weekend i was just gonna say ah, 35th Woo-hoo! annual party, party party roscoe's world famous chili challenge yes started today i was out there setting up the swine utility vehicle <laughs> what is a swine <laughs> utility yep. vehicle it's a swine utility vehicle. <laughs> man you gotta it's see a, it to yeah. believe it you gotta a, see it you know it's, it's a, a boss it's a promo hog. vehicle <laughs> swag you know wagon <laughs> i was getting stuff loaded up digging through finding some stuff and uh you know the t-shirt order didn't come in like i had hoped so we're we do, we're going to be limited on some sizes but while i was still digging out stuff i found an, another case of coffee mugs and i also found a case that i didn't know that the boss had done of beer koozies you know, I mean, Sweet. so uh, everyone you know, loves a beer koozie. We'll, yeah, uh, you know, have ball. We'll have some boss hog bling that we can give out. And you'll be <laughs> um, yeah. doing live remotes from out there, isn't that right? Absolutely, Buster? we're going to we'll be. be uh, Mama Dukes is going to come out there with me, and uh, we've got uh, the uh, oh, the headsets, and we'll be calling in here to Charlie and Eddie Petty in the afternoon. So from six in the morning till four o'clock. 
will uh, be calling in and uh, doing updates and everything. Six so. in the morning, Mama Dukes, you're up that early, girl? Well, no. <laughs> well okay, now, hey, people. Okay. <laughs> the gates don't open till 8 a.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. That, okay. We need to clarify I'm that. I'm just saying <laughs> Charlie is here from 6, and we'll have Plans. someone in the studio oh, till 4. Okay, playing some good jams. I, I was Starting already like, okay, I'm going to grab a little blanket and a throw pillow <laughs> and sw- hang out in the swine you utility vehicle <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yeah so roscoe's it'll be a good time this weekend and everyone's ready to let loose and fly under the radar and not... are, you, are you in there practicing your chili fester made chili oh i tonight. do smell something good yeah, mm-hmm. i did make chili tonight. <laughs> oh you did so is someone on the phone uh yeah Already. hello dave are you there i am here hello everybody hello you, what's dave? happening dave it's another beautiful Thursday. Here we are. Here we're going to be talking to the ghost hunter again tonight, huh? Yeah, ghost rider. Look at her go. Um, yeah. yeah, the ghost biker explorations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Miranda yeah. Young yeah, herself. And uh, you know, we we had to get more from her, you know, part two. We had a lot of comments and interest and feedback, actually. And, you know, we just had to get more because we didn't even tell the whole story. But, you know... Dave, we've had a lot of good content over the past few months. When you look back at some of it, the, you know, things we could really look back on, and you know, Dave Mann's story was incredible. Uh, the Michael stuff, Lichter was great. Yeah, Michael Lichter. <laughs> I was about to say that. <laughs> but, 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 you're slow, but, but the, baby, you're slow. But the, um, the easy rider <laughs> stories, things like that, and um, and the metal sport. What else did wheels. we have we done? What else? Metal what else? Sport wheels. <laughs> what else have we done? We had, we had Rick Fairless. Oh, yeah, Rick Fairless. Rick Fairless from, Stro- Stroker from Strokers, Dallas. Dallas. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we have uh, the whole thing of bringing uh, Rough Boys the movie to uh, to Born to Ride. And we have the John Shope and his incredible story. That's uh, uh, j- I love the, uh, the video, by the way, uh, on Tuesday night show. That uh, that that alone, just that is is such a great story about how he turned a, a stock foxtail into this beautiful custom motorcycle and gave it to one of his employees. Uh, here we're we're going to have Mr. Shope with us next Thursday night, everybody. Yeah, man, that's that's big news too, and uh, thank you for pulling the strings to get that happening. And you know, the Dirty yeah. Tail custom bike. Actually, we're gonna have that feature on born to ride tv this sunday night at 11 on on great 38 in tampa bay uh we had to condense it down so it's really action-packed it's like down to about 12 or 14 minutes and uh, so so it's really a good thing anybody who haven't seen it they can see it actually online or on our facebook page from tuesday night with the flash uh, live show with you and flash day flash morgan where we showed the whole 23 minutes so it was it was just a great story there, and, and next week we'll get to hear more about John Shope, Dirty Bird Concepts, and, and you know a lot of the, his history and the, the whole idea of putting that bike together for his employee. Yeah, and you know the cool thing about the uh, the Dirty Tail kit that he's got is that you can take any soft tail and turn it into a beautiful custom motorcycle. Uh, no matter what, it can be an Evo-powered soft tail. I mean, any of the soft tail models, there's over a million of them still on the road out there. And uh, you can use one of his kits to completely transform a stock soft tail into, you know, like a, just a show-stopping, amazing motorcycle. Yeah, it's incredible. Next week, people, you know, mark it on your calendars. John Shope from Dirty Bird Concepts. Now, that sounds like a perfect uh, insert for the magazine in the future, doing a tech, taking one of those uh, kits and doing a transformation in Born to Ride. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we yeah. could probably follow John and maybe get him to document that. And, you know, ongoing uh, a feature there would be great. Yeah, and he he would love that, I'm sure. And, and it's so important to, to be able to go directly to the source of people who – do what they do and, and to hit that vein. And, and I know we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, we don't want to let all the cats out of the bag, but we're working on some, some really good stories, Dave, aren't we? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We can't uh, mention right now what they are, but yeah, we've we've got some amazing stuff coming down the pike, and uh, some of it is already completed, just waiting to uh, to put it in the magazine, and other stuff is coming down the pike uh, in, in the next six months or so. So, yeah. Yeah, it's an exciting time to be part of the Born to Ride family. I'll tell you that. Man, what about that? Um, what? What about? Zip what, it. What, zip wait, it. wait, 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 wait. Okay, we'll zip choose it. your words wisely. Oh, exactly. Man. You only have one time to make a first impression. We gotta make it. We gotta polish it all up and clean it up. Right. Well, you we, know, Dave, we... I wanted to ask you something. So, um, Frazier's Harley Davidson in um, Georgia is bringing in the Harley Davidson demo truck this weekend to do demo rides. And I am always a proponent of doing demo rides whenever you can, not necessarily just to go buy a bike, but to get the feel if there's something wrong with your bike or the safety of your bike. What do you, what do you think about that over your years with these demo rides? It's, it's so exciting to be able to, you know, with, when Harley does demo rides, they have almost every model motorcycle that they make that you can throw a leg over, and they have these great rides. And what they do, in case you haven't been on one of these, if you've got a motorcycle license, they let you uh, come in and ride any of the motorcycles. They have a route that they, um, they have pre-designed where you'll go. And so they have one or two people from their staff that you go with. And there's probably, you know, there could be a dozen of you that take off together. They do it every year at Daytona, and it's really fun. Uh, if you haven't done uh, one of these demo rides, it's it's terrific. And you get to, you can also, after you do a ride, you can come back and go, well, that was fun, you know, riding this uh, this new soft tail. But, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to, to try that uh, sports route over there. And they say, sure. You know, it's right. it's terrific. Mm-hmm. You haven't done it, everybody. It's it's one of the most fun things you can do. Yeah, and you get to. Um, it's kind of like uh, you know, getting a rental car. You kind of like to get on it, <laughs> hit it hard. Uh-huh. <laughs> you can you yeah. can do what you want, but that's what they're there for. But it's it's always good to just go ride them, just to. I think to make comparisons, is your bike running correctly? Um, you can't just go take a, a bike for a test ride at a dealership, so you can't do that. And unless you have a really good buddy, you usually don't ride your friend's bikes, and you know, unless you get on the wrong one after a fun night or something. But um, so it, it, it is a good time to do that. So I always encourage that as well too. Absolutely, yeah, it's it's great and. Uh, some dealerships now are letting you actually ride the bikes uh, at the dealership too. Mm-hmm. It just depends on the dealership, but uh, it's it's terrific. You know, one thing I have not done, I have not ridden their uh, electric motorcycle, the live wire, mm-hmm. and I hear I hear it's a lot of fun. <laughs> although it's got to be weird to ride a bike that you don't hear. Yeah, I actually rode one years ago when they came through. Uh... The USA, one of the stops, there's only less than a dozen across America, but one was at Brandon Harley, and I got to ride it. I kind of felt like, um, oh, what was, what did I feel like? Is a <laughs> George well, Jetson, oh, maybe? <laughs> no, no, it, it was, I was trying to say something, but um, <laughs> what, what it was was the, the sound, of course, but it, it did have some quick pickup. And oh, there's, I would there's imagine like, torque. Yeah, I mean, yes. straight up, but there was no brake. So you just let off the gas, and it just immediately almost stopped. It was really a, a weird bike. Um, but, you know, we have a feature we just ran on the show last week about going over 110 miles an hour on the drag strip with the with the live wires and doing unbelievable times on some pro uh, drag racers that switched over to the live wire. It's a Harley-Davidson produced spot that they provided and, uh, you know, some exciting things coming up with the electric motorcycle. And Harley-Davidson is leading the way. You know, like the, I think they call it the one. And they kind of redid the very first Harley-Davidson uh, product, production motorcycle from the early 1900s. And they made it into a, 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 a bicycle now. Did you see that that spot, Dave? Yeah. That's very smart. That is very smart. <laughs> the, you know, I've been, for years, I've been thinking, you know, when when I was in high school, you could buy a used Harley 
you know, and ride it to, to, to high school because Aramachi had a deal with Harley and they had these sort of smaller bikes that, that a kid could afford. You know, they had a 350cc sprint model and I had one of those and it said Harley on the tank. You know, well, since then, there hasn't been anything that, that a high school kid could afford to, to ride. You know, uh, and so I always thought that was a terrible idea that they needed to have an entry level bike that a kid can afford. And so now they've got these electric bikes and, and they're like bicycles. They look a lot like the 1903 uh, Silent Gray Fellow single cylinder motorcycle. But and, and it's a neat idea. It's a great idea for it to to look like that. And you can get on this thing and it's all electric and. Uh, I, you know, I just, I don't know what the price point is on that, but, you know, it's like you got to get younger people involved in this lifestyle in order for it to continue mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And I true. think it's a great yeah, idea. Yeah, I, I mean, think that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Harley Davidson has the uh, R&D well in advance. They say they're at 20 years in advance what they're going to come up with. And so if they're planning these new concepts, you know they've got a solid, solid plan to do them. You know, it's not like, hey, let's come up with this idea today and do it tomorrow. They, they're they really on top of their game. Right. Really, really unbelievable. And this is, a, I think it's a winner, This that bicycle. But the live wire is catching on as well. A lot of people have regular Harleys. Say, oh, I'll get one of those too. And, you know, just a matter of marketing and pushing it and getting getting in the dealers where people can actually sit on them and maybe take them for a test ride. And what about now the new Pan Am bike? Um that's uh, coming out in 2021. Yep, uh, Enduro. The Enduro, right. Yep. More of the touring model. Oh, I remember what I was going to say now. When I was riding the bike, I felt like a turtle effing a football. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was like, it's a little too, I was a little too big for it. But, uh, but uh, it just felt like that. So I was like, think about that, a turtle effing a football. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what I felt like. That's a good point, because one of the great things about Harleys, especially, you know, in the mid-80s onward, when they came out with the soft tails, you felt like you were sitting down in the motorcycle. Mm -hmm. It had that custom bike feeling, like a chopper, Mm -hmm. where you're sitting down low, you know, and, and you're reaching up to the handlebars, and that just... Man, that just did it for me. I don't know about you guys, but Mm -hmm. I thought that was really, you know, that's what I wanted. I didn't want to feel like I was sitting way up high on top of a motorcycle. Right, (laughs) right. Especially with a Corbin yeah. gunfighter seat, you sit real low in that in that slouch back. Yeah, remember the Corbin seats? Yeah, Corbin gunfighter. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Check out the. The Warbird. Yeah, check out the Warbird kids, man. (laughs) Um, Dave, you know, next week. John Shope will be live with us uh, talking about, you know, Dirty Bird concepts and all that. But you know what? Tonight we have a great show, and on the phone with us right now is one of your favorite p- people because um, I know you're into this a lot, the paranormal. Yeah. Paranormal. Yeah. <laughs> now, I will tell you. <laughs> I, I don't have that. Oh, you don't have the music? I don't have that. Oh, shoot. Week. We were wondering about where that eerie music goes. Uh-huh. So we have to do it ourselves. We'll have to do it ourselves. But, but, <laughs> but I will tell you, you know, of course, you, DB's making, uh, working our video system and everything. And DB's not a motorcycle enthusiast. But, I mean, you know, the next day he's saying, man, I was sitting there operating the cameras, and I was listening to her talk, and and I had goosebumps on my arms. You know? <laughs> really? you know, he was really getting into well, man, that. It's time for some more goosebumps, Dave. I want scared. you to take it away, man. <laughs> okay, so we, we've got uh, Miranda with us. Absolutely, yes. Hi, Miranda. Okay, how are you tonight? Hi, Miranda. Welcome. How's Thank everything you. going? Thank you for having me on. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Going great. How about you guys? Oh man, good, it's good. A, it's a, exciting to have you back. And you know, Dave's been dying to ask you a few more uh, questions. Of, you know, because he's into this and knows more about it than I do. Or um, so, Dave. What do you think? We've got Miranda back, paranormal yeah. explorer and biker. Yeah. You know, Miranda. What I was thinking is Ooh. it would be kind of cool. If you could walk us through some of the equipment that you use when you go out there and you, have, you set up at a place, 
Uh, and one of the first things is a, a digital voice recorder, which is something that that oh. is not that unusual, <laughs> but it's something that you would use in EVP sessions. And and for folks out there that don't know, an EVP session it's it stands for electronic voice phenomenon. And so uh, to start off with. Can you explain to folks uh, what an EVP session is? Sure, sure. So an EVP session is, like you said, it's an electronic voice phenomenon, and there's typically two types. There's your standard EVPs that you get when you pick up, they pick up on the recorders that you don't hear in the moment, and then there's the others that we call disembodied voices that we actually will hear in the moment. And one of the things that I like to do when I'm on investigations is I typically have about five or six different recorders with me, depending on the size of the location. I'll always have a mobile recorder on me, and it runs from the minute I start until the minute I'm finished. And a lot of the time people in my videos will see me using headphones. And so if you plug those headphones into one of the digital recorders, which mine is just a regular Sony dictation recorder, um, you'll actually be able to hear in the moment what your recorder hears. So it doesn't matter if it's a disembodied voice or not. Um, you can you can hear it in real time, and that's probably my my favorite record my favorite piece of equipment, just because you know a lot of the time with my background in photography I can kind of debunk a lot of the stuff that happens on um, some of the video cameras that that I have set up, but you know when you're the only person in a location or only one of maybe uh, two females when you get a man's voice on there. Um, it's pretty compelling sometimes because you can't really, it's harder to account for that if you, you know, if there's no one else around. And when you set up uh, for an EVP session, what are some of the kinds of questions that you ask? You know, I, I like to know if they can actually see me. And so um, some of the questions that I'll ask, you know, I may hold up, um, you know, so many fingers and ask if they can repeat back how many fingers I'm holding up. Or uh, if I'm using other tools, I may ask, you know, what, uh, ask them to go and, and manipulate one of those tools. Um, I'll also try to ask different questions. When I go in, I try to have names if possible or, um, you know, different trigger items to try to, you know, uh, maybe try to trigger some different types of activity. But I'll try to ask questions specific to, you know, some of the history that I've been able to, to dig up before I go into the location just to see if I can get some names or statements that can validate what, what I've been researching. And what about uh, on the video side? You mentioned video. Do you use that thermal imaging uh, night vision type camera? I do. I use several different kinds. So just as I have multiple uh, recorders, I've got several um, infrared cameras that are run off batteries that I'll set up, and I always set a recorder with those, um, and I sync those up so I can have audio and video. I use a thermal camera as well as um, an SLS camera. The SLS camera actually sends a field out into um, into where I'm, I'm uh, you know, where the camera's pointing, and it will map anomalies that, that could potentially be um, uh, unexplained activity. It will, it will map those as figures if it can pick it up in the, in the grid that it's casting out there. Um, you know, I, tr I try to be selective with some of the equipment that I take. Uh, I do have kind of a, a bug out, military bug out bag that I always have with me. But I try, since I'm on the bike, I try to tailor everything specific to that location. But I've always got recorders and cameras with me. And, and then, you know, when you come back after you've spent an, an evening at a place that is purported to be haunted or that there are some sort of entities or something, um, mm -hmm. how much time does it take for you to review everything? I mean, that must take hours and hours, doesn't it? It does. It, it takes, I try to set myself a deadline. Um, once I investigate a location, I try to have 
all of the audio listened to. I give myself two weeks after a location, and then I give myself four weeks to have all video reviewed um, when I leave a location. But it all depends. You know, if, if I'm doing a, a small house, it, I can usually fulfill it in that time. If I'm doing a large prison or a hotel or some of the larger locations, if I'm in this location for about, say, 12 hours, um, I always have, uh, and if it's a large location, I always have five cameras and five audio recorders. So times all of that by 12, that's how many hours of reviewing that, that I have to do. The audio is a little bit easier because I can sit and do that while I'm, working on different projects but when you're sitting there reviewing the video if you look away you might just miss some something that blips across the screen that that could be unexplainable so a lot of wow, time goes amazing. into yeah just yeah. The, the evidence review afterwards and, and you know last time that we were on together you mentioned uh, electromagnetic field I know there's a mm -hmm. there's a EM uh, what do they call EM, EMF detector do you, do you use that as well? Because I know that people can sometimes uh, have hallucinations or have the feeling mm -hmm. they're being watched, that sort of thing, if they're in a, in a home that has high electromagnetic fields. Is that something that you check for as well? Absolutely, and and that's a very good point. You know, a lot of the t that's one of the base readings that I will go in and check, because you can sort of, in a sense, create your own haunting from just having elevated EMF levels in your home. And uh, I, I'd have a couple EMF detectors as well as K2 meters, and then several other detectors. One of my favorite tools is called an EDI Plus box, and it's it's small. Um, it's a small little box and it has temperature. It reads the changes in pressure. It also has a geophone which detects vibration in case something touches the meter. And then it will also give uh, EMF readings in the moment if something spikes or changes. So it's, it's a really cool little box to use along with other tools whenever when I'm investigating. Amazing. So, so I had you a know, what, what, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I had a question also. So, Miranda, when mm -hmm. you, you take uh, bikers on these tours and um, these explorations and everything, do you raise more bikers out of the uh, out of the spirits, I guess, so to speak? I mean, when you know, when you hear a bike going down the street, everybody turns their head to see what it is. <laughs> Does that happen also in the paranormal world? What about the ghost rider? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually a good point. And, you know, something that uh, can be a good trigger item, especially, you know, I've investigated some haunted bars and, uh, you know, motorcycle sounds as if you know if the person was a biker uh, when they were alive it, it can absolutely trigger that as well as you know certain kinds of music um, there's a lot of cool experiments that that uh, we like to try that can definitely bring out um, different activity especially you know if if that's what they were into when they were alive mm -hmm. i can imagine it's such a brotherhood a strong brotherhood when they're alive i can imagine you know calling out to you and, your, and, and, the, and the group. Yep. Mama Dukes, was yeah, there, was, were there ever any ghosts out there, river rats? <laughs> I don't know. Ooh. If there was, I just kept my eyes closed. <laughs> what about it, Fester? You got a ghost story? Uh, I, a don't, I don't recall there ever being any uh, you know, ghost out at uh, river rats, but uh, I did have a question that I wanted to ask her. Uh, last week, and I'm great. I'm grateful that she's back again this week, so that I could, you know, uh, I know last week you talked about sometimes people will ask you to come out and investigate because they feel like something. And as mm -hmm. you, as a ghost investigator, how mm -hmm. often are you able to verify that or debunk it? In other words, I mean, is it fifty fifty, or you know, uh, you know? Because people's imaginations can sometimes get the best of them. I'm just curious, you know, with the people that call and ask you to come out and check out their mm -hmm. phenomenons, you know, or what they perceive <clears throat> as a phenomenon. How many times has it been a possum in the attic? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and that's a great question as well. Um, you know, a lot of the time, and, and sometimes it's really subtle, um, you know, because... 
you know, they're not performing monkeys. So it's, you know, you go in and, and I do extensive, you know, questioning and, and everything as far as like what they're experiencing and, and when they're experiencing and, and that sort of thing. I would probably have to say, you know, maybe 60, 40, um, that, you know, it's something that's explainable, uh, maybe 40% that, um, go in and I mean because there have been times that I've gone in and I've not found anything you know nothing happened on that night that's why it's awesome when they allow me to come back multiple times um, because you know just because you go in and nothing happens I don't walk away you know right after um, I go in one night and say if I don't find anything explainable that is um, I won't walk away and say okay you know I think it's just your imagination um, we'll try some different experiments you know if I go back on a couple occasions then um, you know if that were the case I would I would probably say you know uh, I would either have someone else come in and see if it's maybe me just not getting something, but there have uh, there absolutely have been times that I've gone in that we found that you know it's been um, you know something that that can absolutely explain. So I'd probably say sixty forty. Mm-hmm. Okay. So wow. Miranda, do you clearly you don't get spooked easily? Have you ever had a time where you're just like, oh, okay, I need mm-hmm. to take a minute, maybe go back outside, you know, mm-hmm. has there been a time that something has like startled you or just kind of gave you goosebumps? There's, you know, there's, there's been a couple times I've definitely been startled. Um, probably the one time that probably really actually truly scared me was I was investigating this um, house that, that we covered in season one and season two. And uh, it was a year long case study uh, for me. And I was in there, and on this one specific occasion, I was trying some different experiments, and I was going to leave cameras out overnight. I had reached out to different people who watched the show, and was like, hey, you know, because they had asked me about This was for season two. They had asked me what had happened, you know, to the house after season one. And so I reached out, and I said, you know, if you'll send me some questions, I'll pre-record those questions, leave some uh, video and audio out overnight, and we'll see what happens. And so as I was setting the cameras up, I was doing a live session, and uh, I had pre-recorded the questions on a recorder. When we went off the live session, my camera guy was still recording, and so I started the recorder with questions. And as soon as I did that, the floor beneath me started vibrating, and all of the different tools on that floor, the flashlights were going off, the um, geofoam on the EDI box was going off, showing that there was vibration. And then um, the different, the K2s, the REM pods, all the different pieces of equipment I had were all going off at one time. And so we walked out of the house and we were, you know, getting ready to leave for the night and we were doing, I always do the prayer of protection before I go in and then when I leave as well. And I remember looking up after praying and seeing the lights flashing from the outside of the house them inside there was no power in this home um (laughs) there was the bathrooms weren't working i mean it was it it was actually one of those situations where i knew it was time for for me to get out of the house because i've never had the floor actually vibrate under me (laughs) oh what a story well we're gonna have to take a break and we'll be back with dave and miranda young in just a moment here don't go away (laughs) you're listening to born to ride radio out the all new born ride.com with radio tv industry adventure events magazine social media and much more it's the all new born to ride.com hi i'm attorney robert rubenstein and this is rubenstein's rules for personal injury rule number one get an attorney when you or a loved one have been injured by another's negligence an experienced attorney can make a huge difference at rubenstein law we will find all of the insurance make sure your injuries are documented and work to get you the best result while each case is different a well-known insurance company's own study showed people with a lawyer on average got more money call rubenstein law at 1-800-FL-LEGAL find us on facebook on ride tv and magazine the ultimate multimedia biker experience.
This is Boss Hog Radio, home of Born to Ride Radio. You can join the motorcycle enthusiast conversation by calling 863-225-2000. That's right, folks. Welcome back to Born to Ride Radio this Thursday evening. <laughs> yes, sir. We've got uh, Dave Nichols and Miranda Young on the lines with us in the studio. I'm Fester Jenkins. I'm Mama Dukes. Ron and Debbie Galetti are here with us. All right. It's another Born to Ride hour. Dave, I, I Dave know, are you back? Yeah. Dave, okay. I know you got a few uh, interesting questions that you were bringing up to uh, Miranda. What, what, yeah, you know, what are you thinking there? We were there? talking about, uh, Miranda, a lot of the tools of the trade that uh, are so unusual to the average person. But uh, do you use, for instance, infrared thermometers to to look for cold spots, which some people believe, you know, that, that ghosts actually uh, lower the temperature in a particular area that there'll be like a cold spot. Do you use uh, that in your uh, ghost hunting? I do. I have a thermal camera. Actually, I have two. I have one that connects to a uh, phone that you can record from, and then uh, which is a flare um, thermal camera and then I also have a handheld that you can record short spurts with and so I always like to take those um, especially as I'm walking through a location to try to find a spot to sit and have an EVP session I always like to have that thermal and then the one that's on the phone that records I like to kind of actually have it setting up filming the entire room um, just in case if you know myself or if somebody's with me say that they're experiencing something cold, um, just to kind of monitor the situation. And, and do you use, there, there are these things called flux response devices that are basically a binary response device where, where you can get a yes or no answer uh, if you ask a question. Do you use anything like that? I do. I use several different things like that. I have an electronic meter that um, you can ask yes or no questions on as well as true and false questions. And then um, I will also use, um, I like to use dousing rods, which, um, you know, obviously they're not electronic, but I like to use those for yes and no questions as well. Um, a lot of the different spirits that I'm speaking to know those tools from back when they used to use them to try to find water. So they're familiar. You don't have to worry about the battery drain that happens with some of the different electronic tools. And then also they're easy and they're not scary because they can just, you know, they can touch them for the yes and no questions. They can cross the rods for yes or keep them straight for no. So they are familiar and they're easy to use for them. So in, in your uh, doing research and, and trying to uncover if you have a location that is uh, actually haunted as opposed to it being, you know, a number of, of things you could debunk, um, mm -hmm. it sounds like that you use a combination of tools that are not only sometimes electronic or uh, tools that you could have a, a real scientific a response from and, and get an idea of what's happening in the location. But also by using dowsing rods and things of that nature, there's a really, there's a spiritual element to this as well, isn't there? There is. And, and you know, I, I try to use a variety and, and take all of that into account because, you know, we're asking a, a lot of these, these spirits to do things that they may not, they may not be familiar with. And so, and if, you know, one of the questions I often ask, you know, like I said, I ask if they, if they can see me, I often wonder if they can even see color. So when we're asking them, you know, to touch a, a light and turn it green or yellow or whatever, I'm not even sure, you know, all the time if they can see color. So I try to take all of that into account. I definitely like to use a scientific approach and I always have a couple couple different tools that helps me to measure the scientific numbers as far as the temperature and pressure and EMF. But you're right, there is definitely a spiritual element to that. And a lot of the time, you know, when I'm investigating, I'll go in with a plan, but I sort of let the location kind of lead me um, to, to a specific area. And so 
I find that, you know, if a spirit wants to communicate, it's going to find a way, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes it sometimes it's more, you know, they're more physical and, you know, more likely, I mean, they may they may touch you or, you know, communicate in a different way. But there's there's definitely that um, spiritual element to that, um, you know, when you're investigating, because there are a lot of you know, personal experiences and stuff that's, that's hard to measure, um, through some of these scientific devices. So, um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a good combination of the two. Now, do you always have to go to the spirits or sometimes do they come to you? Like just when you're sitting in your living room, because they know you're a medium. Yes. So, sometimes they will. Um, sometimes they'll come, you know, I've had that situation happen, you know, sitting at work, um, you know, it, it, it all just depends and, and different people seem to get different reactions sometimes. Um, like when I'm in a location, uh, you know, children's spirits seem to want to communicate with me as well as female spirits. Um, you know, so, but, so it, it really just depends, you know, sometimes you'll be in a location that you don't even realize may have activity and, that, you know, they'll come to you versus, you know, you going and having to, to ask and communicate with them. Now, um, just before you, like, when you find out you're going to a location, do you do, like, any type of research on, like, you know, the property beforehand, like, different years, like, what may or may not, you know, may have happened at the, at the residence? I do. I do. I try to do um, different, you know, different research as far as historical um, you know, what may have potentially happened on the land, uh, and then also um, geographic type research with sort of the geology around, if it's somewhere, you know, like with um, specific types of rock formations, some of those are better conductors. Um, you know, so I try to look at what could potentially be causing the activity and what could actually be maybe heightening the activity as well. Um, so definitely historical research as well as um, the physical research now, of, of the land itself. Now, how do you go about like determining the age if you're talking to an older individual or older spirit or a, a child? Sometimes they'll tell you, um, you know, I usually try to ask age related questions. Um, but, you know, when we get voices on the recorders, sometimes they actually come through as a child's voice or as an older person's voice, um, you know, and, and a lot of it will also kind of come from stories, you know, that, that have been told about that area. Um, you know, if, if I'm going into a house, a lot of the time, a lot of the time, one thing has not just been happening once, you know, a lot of the time it's, it's been happening for a little while. Um, so sometimes the homeowner kind of has an idea um, and other times, you know, it's, it's just based on maybe some of the stories and historical research that I found. And Miranda, well, you know, um, oh, go Miranda ahead. it makes me think that, you know, one of the mm -hmm. reasons I believe that so many people are fascinated by some of the TV series that are on now that, uh, basically are, are ghost hunter type shows is that we're all fascinated with the idea that, that maybe there is, that there's a lot to this phenomenon of uh, that there might be spirits and ghosts. And I think the reason that people are so fascinated with it is that we all want to know what's going to happen after we leave this mortal coil and uh, is there uh, life after death and what kind of, you know, what is what form does that take? And, you know, um, I've, I've read the books of a guy named Michael Newton, who was a Ph.D. and was a, um, a hypnotherapist that he mm -hmm. discovered lives between lives when he would regress people. And I just mm -hmm. wonder, you know, with all the experiences that you have had, what's your take on uh, life after death. Do you feel that the ghost phenomenon in part uh, is proof that there's more, that we, we actually have something that will happen uh, after we leave, you know, Earth? 
That's that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I mean, personally for myself, you know, I'm I'm learning something every time I do this, and um, you know, my theory as to what it is is constantly changing. But I've I've always been a person of faith, and um, you know, doing this, I've been doing this for for ten years now. Um, it, it's really just sort of strengthened my faith in an afterlife. Um, you know where they're communicating from again i'm still trying to kind of figure that one out but for me it definitely strengthens that belief that something does happen to us after we after we pass do you do you feel that if there is a ghost phenomenon that it can sometimes be someone who maybe doesn't realize that they've passed on and that they need um, help in, you know, go to the light, Carol Ann, kind of thing. <laughs> Isn't uh, that you, purgatory? Do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you, do you feel yeah, that you know, uh, it's interesting that uh, we have that found that at on. times that, um, you know, whether it be an instance where the passing happens so quickly, um, you know, that one of the cases that that, a ha- that that happened at was this lost furnace. Um, you know, where, where the guy had fallen into the furnace and um, it had happened so quickly from from the evidence that we were able to get back from that, it, it gave the impression that he didn't know he was dead. And that's that's one of the questions that I will always ask whenever I'm doing an investigation. If I've got a communication EVP session going, one of them that I will always say is, you know, do you know you're dead? And there have been several times where they, you know, different pieces of evidence have come back where they didn't know, you know, so, or they've answered, you know, no, they didn't know that. Now, now Miranda, after we um, spoke last week, we got a few calls about, so how do you set up the tours? Do you map out a ride? And I know you said you'd like to, to, um, Pick out some historic views along the way first. Yeah, or how would a promotion go down? Mm-hmm. Um, well, what I've done in the past, and and you know, like I said, this year is the first year that um, we were able to really, you know, get in and do a really good ride with this. Um, I actually mapped it around uh, so that we're doing a historic bike event. Uh, excuse me, they were doing a bike event at this historic location. And so um, I was really trying to get riders to go to this event. And so what I did was I really just kind of mapped the ride around the event. And so, um, so I mean, there's a lot of good riding in East Tennessee. So what I ended up doing was I went and I found um, just just a bunch of historic and haunted places along the way. And, and we, you know, we didn't stop at most of them because, um, because the ride was to go to this event, a, a historic event. But um, I just went and just did my research at that point and then just put the videos together around it, around that actual ride. But you could actually plan it around, you know, if you have some places along the ride, it could actually be planned just along the ride and not so much around the destination mm-hmm. afterwards. Okay, that's awesome. And then you, you have some stops along the way they can stop and do take photos and that type of thing too? We did on that one, yes. Mm-hmm. There was uh, two, two stopping points um, because we had a specific time that we had to be to the back event. Mm-hmm. But um, <clears throat> if it hadn't have been planned, and, and again, I didn't realize it was going to be such, such a huge event um, because we ended up having uh, over 100 bikes. And we thought we were only going to have about 25. And so um, the plan in the future is to actually have multiple stops. They'll probably actually be longer Mm -hmm. rides. Um, This one was a 124-mile ride. Mm -hmm. And so I would actually want it to be a little bit longer but have more in-depth stops along the way. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And it was it was really yeah, that, neat that because like great fun. the videos, yeah, the videos that went with it uh, released two uh, 15 minute videos that actually told the entire route. It had it mapped out, and then it had stops or had all the pa- places along the way that we would be passing 
and I told the story as I was riding on the motorcycle and had different shots and everything from it. So um, from my feedback that I've got over the past years or past six months since we did the ride, there have been a lot of people that have actually gone back and gone to some of those specific locations along the way and, and tried to find more information out about those. So it's actually increased some of the tourism, which has been really interesting. Mm, Miranda, I wanted to ask you um, what brought us together and um, very unique ghost biker explorations that you do, but that what mm -hmm. really brought us together is the motorcycle, the two wheels uh, that you obviously have passion for. So tell us... Mm -hmm. What is riding to you, and, and how does it correlate with everything that you do? I'm, I'm sure everybody's got to get out on the road and get their mind right, you know, and get to think and uh, create ideas. How does it work for you, and what, what, how important is the motorcycle in your life? Oh, I mean, it's, it's huge for me because it, it is, you know, it is where I find my freedom, and it is where I find my, you know, get, get centered and get grounded um, because, you know, I do a lot of, thinking when I'm on that bike. So for me, there's no better way when traveling to these investigations to sort through it and, and really plan what I want to do. And then also it, it really helps me with the investigations too, because in my life and also in the investigations, it helps me cut through the clutter. You know, you can, when I'm planning these investigations, you can just get kind of bogged down with taking a lot of equipment and, and just, you know, trying to do so many different things in this limited amount of time. Well, you know, because I am traveling uh, on on the two wheels and stuff, it, it really helps me to kind of set that mindset from the beginning of, you know, take, you know, only what you need. And then also, I mean, it's just a constant reminder of just how fun mm -hmm. it is and, and how blessed I am to be able to combine both of those two passions. That's awesome. One one thing we ask a lot of our guests is, what is the secret to your success? And sometimes, you know, that people don't think they have success, but to do what you've done, there's success there. What motivates you uh, to be so unique and, and to keep keeping on? And, you know, what's the secret there to you, motivation? Probably just the drive. And, and you know, when when you enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't even really – seem like you know you're you're really working and um you know really just seeing seeing the interest and seeing you know that um i guess the empowerment and stuff that's come from it um you know from talking to people who either are interested in ghost hunting or interested in motorcycles um it's really given me a good platform to to be able to talk about both and i've seen people you know, getting into both because of it. Um, but really just, just being able to see, it, it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me as far as, you know, getting to meet and talk to some, some really awesome people and also being able to go to some great locations and sharing the stories. So, you know, just being able to share those stories and, um, you know, as far as with, with the history and then with the travel, um, and, and sharing these new locations that people might not be aware of. That's really kind of what motivates me on that. Awesome. Well, that's awesome. I yeah. know we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, Dave, man, you, what do you got, man? We're getting ready to uh, close, close it out, it out man. Well, but, uh, here's the thing. Um, I find this so fascinating. And, and, Miranda, please tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, how they can go to your website, see the episodes of your show, uh, please uh, uh, do a little uh, shameless self-promotion, if you would. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you all again for having me back. It's it's just been a blast. I love answering, you know, the questions and everything. So, um, but, yeah, people can watch the past three seasons. We just wrapped up season three. But you can watch all three seasons on the Ghost Biker Explorations Facebook page, as well as the Ghost Biker Explorations YouTube channel. You can see the different you know, photography that I've taken at some of these locations as well as some of my different drawings on my Instagram page, Runaway Vixen, as well as under www.ghostbikerexplorations.com. Everything is, is on the website there. 
Very cool. Awesome, well, we, man. We certainly we appreciate, appreciate it, it. Miranda. Yes. Thanks for coming back, you know, because there were questions that we didn't get to have asked yes. last week, and, uh, you know, it's been a great show. Yeah, Thanks the exciting so tour. We're going to have to come back well, again you. and once in a while, for sure, get get a ghost biker update. And a, and a oh, tour. I would love that. Can you imagine? We've got some big things. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, can you imagine I, Daytona Beach during bike week? We could do oh. um, the Boot Hill Saloon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, what's across yeah. the street, the right. cemetery, the yeah. Blue Hill Cemetery. And I bet. There's so much down there. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, people don't realize, you know, with when it comes to the biker bars and uh, different locations mm-hmm. where people, you know, that's their their hideaway, their, their, their heaven, you know, that's where they go to kind of get away. And so, you know, why not? Why but, not come back? You there's know? a lot of lost souls out there that yeah. are dead and there's a lot of lost souls that are alive so we're gonna find them we're, we're gonna search them out and we can't wait to work with you more and we're gonna get more updates from you but man this hour flew by thank you so much thank you dave too thanks miranda oh, you thanks good, miranda. Yeah, yeah, thank thanks, you again. Thanks, we'll have guys. a lot in 2021 yeah. coming up awesome so. oh. yes sir thank you so much there well dave uh you know, we've got just a minute or so left, and I want to, you know, we've got something going on in Central Florida here, folks, right in your backyard this weekend. It started today, and mm-hmm. that's Roscoe's Chili Challenge. Mm-hmm. Dave, you want to yeah, say absolutely. anything before, uh, you know, we leave out of here? Yeah, folks, if you haven't been to Roscoe's Chili Challenge, it is absolutely one great way to experience the freedoms that we have here in America Make sure to get down to Lakeland. Check out Roscoe's Chili Challenge. It is one of the best, absolute best biker weekends you could possibly have. And the chili's pretty good, too. (laughs) For (laughs) adults only, please. A lot of body pain. Adults only. 21 and above. And that's why, you know, I've got the disclaimers right here. I've got the disclaimers right here that we're going to read off so that people, if they're curious and they're interested. Caution, enter at your own risk. (laughs) <laughs> Roscoe is not responsible for the following personal injury, personal property, pregnancies, <laughs> VD or clap, <laughs> any other STDs, not responsible for weddings, lost spouses, lost property, lost virginity, <laughs> old lady in the wrong tent, old man in the wrong tent. <laughs> And last but not least, not responsible for any of the divorces. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to go, man. you got to see this. It's epic. It's... We're have looking a, forward to it. Have an open mind. Yeah. As Roscoe Just says, if you want to feel freedom, come to Roscoe's Chili Challenge. Oh, that's funny. Absolutely. Y'all have a great uh, time. Thanks again, Dave, for joining us on Born to Ride. Great Ray. questions, too, Dave. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, we'll see you next week. That was right, awesome, week. man. Okay, Thank you so much. Dirty Bird Concepts next week next coming week. up. Yep. And as I always end the show, keep safe. Keep it in between the ditches. Have a great time. And yeah, for the witches. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Adios. If Instagram is your thing. We're there. <laughs> Follow us at hashtag Born to Ride Motorcycle Media, your number one motorcycle resource. Yeah, I have to say, Born to Ride has been a big influence on my trailer sales in the last two or three months. It's been nothing but a big surprise. I mean, the magazine articles, everything in the commercials, it's been nothing but the best of help to me in my business. Is your business becoming invisible? Create a great advertising relationship today with Born to Ride. Call 888-795-5779. This is the Boss Hog Radio Network. 1170 AM WKFL Bushnell, 1330 AM WWAB Lakeland Plant City, 1360 AM WHNR Cypress Gardens Winter Haven, and 1390 AM and 107.5 FM WAVP and W298BU FM Avon Park.